This is an interview for the Eat Street Oral History Project sponsored by the Whittier Alliance. It is Sunday, April 9, 2017, and I'm here at the Whittier Alliance office with Sammy Rizzuli, who used to own and operate Sinbad's Cafe and Market. Is that the correct title of the business? Yes. Uh, DBA, doing business as Sinbad Center Inc., that's the uh, official registered uh, uh, identity okay. entity, but uh, we have the uh, honoring the, the name of the place at Simbat's Cafe and Market. Okay. Sammy now lives in his native Najaf, Iraq, but travels back to Minnesota regularly and has agreed to speak with us while he's here. Brad Baker is video recording the interview, and my name is Kim Hakela. I own and operate Spotlight Oral History. Today I'll be talking to Sammy about his experiences moving from Iraq to Minnesota, the life of Sinbad's on Eat Street, and his return to Iraq. So thank you and welcome, Sammy. I'm really glad to have you. Thank you for having me. It's really great opportunity that it happens uh, while I'm visiting uh, this project, the video project uh, took place. So I'm glad really uh, to be part of it. Excellent. All right, so I'm just gonna have to start with some very basic questions. And um, one of which is, can you please, I've already said it, but can you state and spell your name? Sami, S-A-M-I, Rasuli, R-A-S-O-U-L-I. And just to clarify again, tell us where you live now. Uh, I live in Najaf, Iraq, and uh, with my family. So since 2004, when I decided to go back, work for peace between my two communities, my two countries, uh, Iraq, my country by birth, and the USA, my country by choice. And often I'm asked, Sammy, please make up your mind. Are you an Iraqi or an American? And actually I explain that I'm an Iraqi 100%, I'm an American 100%, and that makes me 200% human being. <laughs> And to be human beings is not easy because you have to elevate yourself above flags, boundaries, to be a global citizen where you belong as a particle of this universe. So uh, I'm, if you ask me again, who are you? I'm a universalist. If, uh, I'm allowed to say so. Absolutely. And so, um, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, but I just want to clarify. So right now, you are a full-time peacemaker. That Correct. That is what you do. Correct. A peacemaker, it's as entity, identity. Uh, I like it uh, more than uh, identifying myself as a Muslim, where I was born in that culture and uh, spent half of my life. And the other half, second half of my life, I uh, grew up in a Christian society, which is the US. So uh, to be above both of them, then I got this new identity or which is peacemaker. So peacemaker, uh, I'm not boxing myself in a, in a certain group. So I'm for everybody. All right, thank you. And you said that you live in a job with your family. Who is in your family? Now? My family, uh, so that is my wife. Uh, I remarried in Iraq in 2007. Uh, I have from her uh, three kids and adopted son or stepson. She was divorced when I, uh, we both were divorced. So my first wife lives here uh, with my three grown up kids. Uh, but uh, in 1995, uh, we were separated. Uh, so Suad and Najaf with uh, Omar. Uh, 10 years old, 
uh, by now it has been 10 years old when I re uh, remarried, I mean when I was engaged to Suat in, in 2007, January 2007. Um, Ro'ya is uh, four years old, female, and Isa, Jesus, three years old, uh, son. Uh, beside, of course, uh, 15 years old, my stepson, Rida, R-I-D-H-A. So you have a whole range of children, age-wise, from little yes. to adult. Yes, the three grown-up kids from my first wife, Fatima, uh, Saif, he's 34, uh, father, has five kids. His uh, wife is pregnant, so <laughs> they're going to be six soon. Um, he's, uh, he, see, Saif is unique. He's, uh, uh, has hearing difficulties. He was born that way. And he went to school in Rochester, New York. And that gave him opportunity to meet his uh, fiancée later his wife, uh, Carissa. Uh, then he had the opportunity to choose his religion. So he's a Baptist. <laughs> and Baptist pro-life uh, decided to non-stop producing kids. <laughs> yes. Go. All right. Um, uh, and you have already answered this in part, but I'm going to ask it of you as well, because I've been asking everybody that we've been interviewing. How uh, do you identify yourself racially or ethnically? I am a, an Arab Muslim Iraqi individual uh, who, uh, since I was uh, young, always I dreamt to uh, go and experience the culture of the West. So when I decided to leave Iraq at age of 24, my dad said to me, are you sure you want to leave us? I told him, yes, I have this interest to discover the other part of the world. Then he gave me uh, an object that flat, square, by like two inch by two inch, uh, but covered with wax. And he asked me to scratch, remove that wax every time I go to a different country. And he said, when you get to your destination, the last stop, you, have, you should have removed all the wax and you look at it, then you find out what the other side of the world looked like. And it happened that was a mirror. So when I looked at it, it was myself and myself, like we are all the same. That was his message. It's not different. <laughs> yeah. So the other side, it's here. This is like related to how you think globally, but you act locally because each local place is part of the whole thing, and then it's it's the same. Now, had your father traveled? Had he, I mean, how did he? How do you think he came by that insight? Uh, yes, he traveled traveled a lot, and uh, actually, we all. Uh, where I was born in Iraq, but my other uh, uh, siblings were born uh, outside of the country because my dad used to travel and uh, he lived, for example, in Kuwait, in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, neighboring countries, yeah, Iran. So he has this uh, philosophy of uh, we are one. And actually, uh, as I indicated in the beginning, that the, the first half of my life, uh, growing up in, in 
Islamic culture, I learned the unity, like we are one, our creator is one, and the message of the creator is one, undivided. Because if we are one related to each other, I mean, um, religiously, we go back to Adam and Eve, our ancestors, first ancestors, and all three uh, monotheistic, uh, monotheistic religions. But scientifically, the DNA says the same thing. We, we came from the same origin. Uh, that's the Islamic teaching, which teaches about unity. Then when I moved here and learned about the uh, Christian teaching, which is uh, the unconditional love, so I, I learned that here. And, and in combination of both unity and unconditional love, also it's emphasized and, and assure the unity of the universe than uh, in, in a local level. We are united. So when my father gave me that piece of mirror, uh, it's explained it all that the other side, it doesn't make, I mean, it's not different than what we are. Mm -hmm. So we are interrelated uh, in our uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit then about your family in Iraq when you were growing up. You said you had siblings. Are, how many siblings do you have? We all are seven. Seven. Yeah. Four sisters and three boys, okay. three and where are you brothers. Living? I'm first. You're the first? Yeah, I'm okay. the eldest. Okay. Um, and what did your father do for a living that he was traveling so much? He was a carpenter, and uh, his job was like wanted, and he was looking for always better uh, pay, so keep moving and coming back, keep moving. Now, was he also born in Iraq himself? Yes. And what about your mother? She was born in Iraq, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did she work outside the home? No. She was, like, f uh, working at home full-time job. Yeah, full-time job, yes. <laughs> As a mother yeah. and wife. Okay. Um, and so, you did your whole family then... Well, they must have because your siblings were born in these other countries. You all moved together to follow your father, right. his job. Yes. So where did you spend most of your time as a young person growing up? Well, uh, I remember in Kuwait. In Kuwait, uh, I went to fourth grade. I don't remember how old I was when we moved to Kuwait after my birth, but uh, I was like fourth grade, then we moved back to Iraq. Then my father, uh, after a few years with, his, with the family, moved back. But prior to that, he was moving between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and other places. And what language or languages did you speak at home? Arabic only. And so you said you, you were in Kuwait through the fourth grade, you remember that? Yes. Um, can you describe your education in general from that point forward or what, what kind of schooling did you have as a young person? Well, it was an elementary school and uh, um, I, I liked it actually there. It was, uh, Kuwait was like a young country, not an old country, uh, adjacent to Iraq, but it's different country. Uh, despite the fact Iraq always claimed that Kuwait is part of Iraq and there were wars about it. Um, then uh, I completed my education in Iraq. Uh, 
and later on uh, I did my master in Germany, uh, Psychology, which is psychology, uh, in Münster, North Rhine, Westfalen. Then I moved uh, to the U.S. So you moved to Germany specifically to go to school? I, yes, yeah. And uh, uh, actually before that, when I was at age of 24, as I said earlier, uh, I was fascinated by the culture of the West. I was listening to Voice of America in Iraq uh, by radio station, only a radio station. And always I liked the music. Uh, and uh, my first station to move in was UAE, Dubai. So I stayed there six years, then I moved to Germany. And uh, in Dubai, I met my first wife. Uh, she was, or she is, um, uh, Lebanese by Palestinian background. Uh, she was born in Lebanon, but her heritage uh, Palestine. And uh, so we met there, and we moved to Germany. Then uh, we moved to the U.S. And what year were you born? I should ask this a while ago. Uh, in 1951. 51. Okay. So when you were 24, it was 1975. 76. Something like that. Okay. 75. 76. Okay. So you were, okay. So it was in the 70s where you were going yeah. to the UAE and right. then to Germany six years after that. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, and I think you, you mentioned this earlier before we were recording. You said, you know, that for many Americans, when we hear or when we think of Iraq, we think of war, we think of, of terrorism and terrorists. Um, and, and the reverse is true of Iraqis thinking of Americans and hearing infidels. Yes. So tell me, uh, you know, how would you describe your life in Iraq before you came here? Uh, it was a simple life, peaceful. Um, uh, we don't have it now because of the turmoil that the country is uh, experiencing after the invasion of 2003 and prior to that was a dictatorship that we had with a, a cruel uh, leader of uh, Iraq at that time, Saddam Hussein. But uh, when I was young, uh, we had really nice life very peaceful and schools were excellent and uh, illiteracy was zero in the 70s. We didn't have, yes. The country was clean. Uh, we, I remember because we didn't have uh, the municipality of the city of Najaf, didn't have enough uh, workers to clean up the city. I remember there was a day, like weekly, once, as students, we go and clean streets. It was a nice practice for us to learn about how we should take care of uh, the, uh, the sanitation uh, of the city to keep it clean. Uh, and also, when uh, that when we were in the uh, uh, elementary school, but later on, in the middle school and high school, uh, in the summer, <clears throat> we were uh, helping to build schools and hospitals by digging and having foundations for these buildings set by the students. So we were uh, participating physically uh, and, the, and that it call it amal shabi, the the public work for the country, like the idea uh, how uh, 
you have the love for the country where you belong to uh, uh, begins, like uh, to grow your love for the country. Uh, so you, you build your country, you keep it clean and, and do that stuff. And that was just part of the education yes. system. Yes. That this yeah. kind of civic engagement. Correct. That, you know, you are citizens of this, yes. this country, this city, and you're going to help. This is where you belong to, and this is what you should uh, be faithful and you care about. So that was the message we, we learned while we were growing up. And of course, we moved from neighborhood to another neighborhood to uh, show uh, we belong to the whole city, community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, we knocked at the door like people to get the um, garbage and the waste to take care of that and send it to the truck. Uh, and, and by that, uh, I mentioned about the unity. So it's like every house is our house. Every neighborhood is our neighborhood. Every city is our uh, city. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you say you move from neighborhood to neighborhood, do you mean as students or your family? No, 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 as a student as to, to take care, work. yes, to do the work. And so these values were commonly shared by other people. Of course, in, yeah, yes, in the job, yes, in yes. One of the values, uh, actually, when you move from place to place, you mentioned it. if you move or you are as a student, you do this. Um, when we move to another neighborhood, the neighborhood will be uh, alert that you're coming so they meet, they lo don't let us cook for seven days because they know we will be busy to get settled. So they rotate every day, food comes from the neighborhood for seven days for three meals, breakfast, yeah, uh, lunch and dinner. <laughs> so the neighborhood was uh, associated from day one with you. And they feel you like you're part of the community, you're part of the family, you're part of everybody else. So this is uh, what was accustomed uh, while we were uh, there uh, growing up in that first half of my life. <laughs> and so, um... What about your family? Were there any particular values? I mean, you've already talked about your father a bit and with him giving you the mirror. Yes. Were there any other particular values that were important to your family in particular? Well, uh, again, terrorism that we're facing today, like global terrorism, never was part of the teaching that I received when I was young, like killing or beheading or uh, disrespecting, I mean, all this violence was n nothing like it within the environment where I was growing up. Uh, it was always this motto, like your neighbor, your neighbor, your neighbor, then you like three times the emphasis of the importance to take care of your neighbor than yourself. And now, and within the family, this is in the neighborhood, within the family, your mother, your mother, your mother, emphasis on the mother than your father. <laughs> Why? Because the mother, her work, her commitment, to raise her kids, it's bigger and more important than the father, who always out there work hard to bring some bread to put on the table. But you, your relationship to your mother is so uh, profound, and therefore you have to give your respect to your mother. And and here uh, I should uh, clarify some mis conception about women, how women are not treated well, for example, uh, in the Islamic country. So th this is Islamic teaching. 
to uh, respect your mother. And the mother is your sister, it's your uh, wife. Uh, I mean, the, the, a young girl get born, baby, she's born as a mother <laughs> because of her physical uh, structure. And whether she's your daughter, your sister, your wife, or your mother, she's a mother. Uh, and from that uh, aspect, the father treat her as a queen, tell her, don't work, you stay at home, and I bring the whole what I earn and give it to you, and you <laughs> uh, do what you want with it. So this is how is it. I mean, whether that's right or wrong, but this is culturally uh, practiced. In, uh, in, in Iraq as part of the whole uh, Islamic countries or world, Islamic world. And, and so clearly that's how your family um, organized itself, was with these values right. and, and this, the structure. Yes, yes. And, and it worked. Of course, right. yeah. Of course, when we talk about the mother and her uh, importance role and how we should respect, uh, we don't forget fa our fathers. Uh, our siblings, sisters, and brothers. Um, we learn that when you get in the bus and when an old uh, woman or man comes in and you have to provide your seat for them, uh, if you see an elderly people crossing street, you go right away and help that a little street cross there. Yeah, uh, so... <laughs> um, during the Eid's festivals, like Eid al-Fitr, uh, the breakfast after Ramadan, there are three days Eid. Uh, in the Eid, people gather together. They meet. And if they have some disputes, some disagreements, all these will remove away uh, and reconciliation starts uh, and this is an Islamic thing there is the big Eid or Eid al-Kabir which is four days after Hajj so again reconciliation if there are some disputes that's all goes away and between sisters brothers friends and uh, community members mm -hmm. so all these things are good <laughs> in the Islamic uh, uh, culture that what where I grew up and it sounds like there's just this very nice and um, committed sense of community that, yes. you're, that you aren't just you yeah. know, operating it's, yeah. on your own. It's, it's not necessarily religious we are committed, but culturally for the uh, uh, values that really bring us together. And recently, Gallup's uh, institution or it's an agency the, the yeah, part of yeah mm -hmm. so they this is 2016 they found out Iraqi people are uh, the most generous people toward foreigners so that's a nice thing to know <laughs> and uh, I think Iraqis beside Arab people generosity is there at the Arab part of main part of Arab culture, generosity. So uh, this goes back way to a leg legendary uh, character called Hatam Tai. Hatam Tai, uh, that before Islam, uh, was a very generous person who lit the light at night to tell the by traveler to stop by eat or sleep if they need. And within the days, he let the dogs he had barking. So also, the by, uh, the by travelers, they hear and they come and, and, and do things. So he was very famous uh, and as a raw model for generosity uh, and gave everything he had just to do this. 
so he had two kids, uh, Savannah, uh, daughter, and Uday. Uh, both, when Islam uh, was there, they embraced and became Muslims and continue, continue the tradition of the father. Of course, everybody uh, met them affected by that generosity and it's became uh, a practice, like part of the human behavior at that area, to be generous, to be welcoming. Uh, and uh, discriminately, I mean, it's, it's not because you are Muslim, you are non-Muslim, you are Arab or uh, a foreigner, everybody is, is welcome and, and embraced in that area when, when it happens like you be there. So uh, I wrote about this many times because uh, many American travelers who comes for reconciliation to Iraq, to Negev, uh, according to our uh, sister city, Minneapolis Negev sister city uh, program, they come and they ask me this question, Sammy, how come this warm welcoming there, the generosity and uh, uh, kind hospitality. So I tell them the uh, story about Hatem al-Tahi, the legendary uh, figure. So then I go further, like 2,000 back, 2,000 years back, uh, and remind them that uh, <clears throat> the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, when he told us to love our enemies. That's the ultimate of nonviolence and the ultimate of generosity. Because generosity, uh, it's a form of nonviolence. Because you give without receiving. It's not swap, it's not exchange. Uh, generosity is giving. Clinton, uh, the husband, wrote about how to be giver or how uh, uh, the givers are uh, so important. Giving is so. So that, that was uh, to love your enemies. Uh, actually, somebody said he, Jesus meant don't kill your enemy. Uh, uh, I saw it differently. I saw uh, don't kill your enemy because the enemy might be you. Uh, and, and why it's you uh, because uh, if you are ignorant of knowing yourself, like self-knowledge, then there are enemies. Otherwise, again, we are one, interrelated, so there is the mirror, there is no uh, others. The others, us. <laughs> so th th this is the uh, idea. And we try to explain this to our kids, teach them. Uh, and I keep telling them about it. I mean, uh, if the Arabs or the Iraqis are generous now, but Jesus Christ told us this 2,000 years ago, uh, told everybody, I mean, the, the human community, told them, hey, don't kill me, all right? And uh, uh, you are the enemy because uh, if you are ignorant or you are... Uh, uh, the ego, what do you call that? Yeah, I mean, uh, arrogant. <laughs> yeah, so you miss the point. When you become ignorant, so they don't, you don't know, or he doesn't know himself, herself. Uh, if you're arrogant, same thing applies. So uh, self-knowledge is important to know who we are and where did we come from and we are, where we are heading. So that helps. So uh, where I came from, I should work hard for it to, to learn about it. And where I'm heading, my father told me, he said, you're heading to yourself <laughs> by that piece of mirror. So, so taking this conversation and kind of using it as a segue into your own travels out of and away from Iraq, you go to the UAE for six years, and you meet your first wife there, yes. and marry there yes. while you're there. Yeah. Um, and then, do you have kids 
do you have children while you're in the UAE? No. So not until yeah. I discovered something about my first wife uh, when I when we were married. Before that, I didn't know. Uh, we were in Germany. She said, "I'm pregnant, and I would like uh, to have my family taking care of me while I'm delivering the baby." Here in Germany, only you and I. And I thought, well, I know she had 12 siblings, including her. So, but they are scattered in Saudi Arabia, in Bulgaria, in Lebanon, and in the U.S. So she said, my mother in the U.S., I go to the U.S. And how could you go there? She said, I'm an American citizen already. So when she came here, my kids, of course, born American, those the... the and while uh, her family took care of her, so... <laughs> okay, so all three yeah. of your children, yes. your oldest children, they were born, born here, US. yes. Okay, so she came here to deliver children. And were you still in Germany? I was in Germany when she was pregnant, yeah. She delivered, then she bring me the, okay. the baby yeah, to Germany. We didn't stay long in Germany, about uh, eight years, then we... Uh, um, moved back i mean we came to the u.s yeah so and you said you got a uh, your master's in psychology yes in germany in germany and so why did you decide then ultimately to move with all of the family to the united states um the first child uh was born deaf but we didn't know that in Germany, he was one year old, and uh, I found out he cannot speak. Uh, so when I go like Papa, he goes without sound. So we had to take him to a doctor and double see what's the problem. And we got the report that he has, uh, the inner ears were defected. Uh, the mother couldn't take it, it was really, uh, it was hard on her. And she decided to come here to, and her family was in Texas, in um, Fort Worth, Fort Worth, Dallas area. So she did the same. Uh, and, and we got the same results, that he was deaf. Uh, then uh, my brother, who was already in the U.S. and in Minneapolis, he suggested to bring Safe, the older son, and have him treated in Mayo Clinic. So that was kind of the reason to be here. Okay. And so what year did you move, you and your family moved to the U.S. and then to Minnesota? Uh, it was, well, the son was born in 1983. And, um, and uh, I, my first visit to Dallas was 1984. But I went back to Germany because I was still not settled here. Um, then here in, in, in Minnesota, I settled in 1986-87. And so you have two other children born yes. after. And so are boys, girls? One boys, of them? three boys. Three boys. Yeah. Okay. And what Saad, is? 33 years old. He just moved to... San Francisco, his girlfriend from there, so and she's a flight attendant, and they agreed to <laughs> stay there, and he liked it since it's uh, warmer, nicer, and he told me that every winter here he has kind of depression. I don't know what they call it. They have this seasonal affective. Yeah. yeah. Um, talking about safe, the oldest. He also moved 
I think more than a year ago to Colorado Spring. So he's there with his family. Uh, Tarek, who is 27, he's here. Uh, he had uh, a band play music called uh, uh, something Quincy, uh, Oliver Quincy. Yeah, Oliver Quincy. So he goes around and <laughs> play music in nightclubs. Yeah, and actually, he's renting the Licorice Beach on Lake in Chicago. It's a building where uh, his group rehearse, and sometimes he leases it or sublease it to an events kind of hall. You can use it for a gallery or other activities. Yeah. So you and your family then end up in in Minneapolis right, right away, right. eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah. Um, did you live in Whittier? Did you live in this neighborhood? We lived in uh, Fridley. In Fridley. Okay. But uh, my first business, uh, I drove a cab first. Then two years later, uh, I had Simbads on Northeast Minneapolis. For uh, two years then, uh, we had to be relocated here by the second precinct, they needed the block where I was renting uh, in 1923 Central. So uh, moved here and uh, while I'm here from 1992 until 2004 when I saw the place. Okay. And what was the address here? 2528 Nicollet. Okay, so it's just, just across. Yeah. Nicollet from here. Right. Okay. Across from this uh, Calav Calaver, Cala the uh, Vietnamese. Oh, okay. Fu oh, oh, Caravel. Caravel. Yes. yes. Okay. 79. Okay. Yeah. The okay. Fu 79. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, so you you spent just a few minutes ago some time talking about the values that you grew up with. Um, in, in Iraq, in Najaf, and how, how did they translate to life in the United States? What did you find to be the biggest difference for you yeah. living in the U.S.? Yeah. Sinbad was an accident for me because I never was a cook or was a, a, a businessman. Uh, I was a teacher when I was in Iraq. Uh, in, United, in United Arab Emirates, I was a teacher. So, but here, I kind of enjoyed by being one of the leaders in the community, Arab Muslim community. So one night while I was in bed, I received this call, like it was a midnight. Uh, Sammy, we need you right now. It's very important. And actually, it was across from Simbad. There was uh, an Arab restaurant where the meeting was. In the, in northeast, or here, right here? Here, here. Okay. Yeah. And what I learned about uh, the problem at that time was two partners got in a fight because they couldn't continue a project of business. They spend money but they couldn't uh, do it. And they reached to a point of disagreement needed to split, but everybody wants his money. They have the place, but the place is non-functional. Uh, like the one party spend the money, the other party spend little money, but he, said, I will run it because I have the experience. It appeared that he didn't have the experience, like making the pita bread. So he didn't know, but yeah. Uh, at the end, they said, well, you cheated me, you took my money, you did. So I had to buy them out to solve the problem. And I took over the place and I spent more money. And that was in Northeast. 
Then we moved <laughs> here after getting re relocated by the second prison. Okay. So up until this point, up until they called you and said help, help with this, yeah. you had been driving a cab? A cab, yes. And so you had saved enough money that you could afford? Correct. I paid them, I wrote them at two checks, and then each of them took me aside and wants me to be his partner in this him. I said, no, I'm here to solve the problem. Uh, pay you both, yeah, and uh, let me deal with it. Uh, and at that point, I didn't know anything about, yeah. But the community learned about it, and they came and, and, and helped me how to run it. So a uh, few young people came and did the PETA, and the other guy gave me the addresses of where I can buy supplies like groceries, Middle Eastern groceries from Chicago. Uh, so with the time, I learned. Uh, but at that, yeah, I had like, I think four taxis. Uh, yeah. See, what, when I came from Germany, and uh, I had money. I didn't use any uh, economic assistance. Or, I had money, but I didn't know where to invest. I didn't have the experience, I didn't have the uh, knowledge about the area. So it took me some time to learn. And this uh, event, the disputed uh, two people about Simbads, and actually it wasn't Simbad, then I gave it the name of Simbads, yeah, the, the place. So uh, I learned the business and ran it successfully. But because I'm not a businessman, I mean initially, uh, I'm an education person, so I used Simbad as a cultural center to introduce Arab Muslim culture to the uh, an average American people. And from <laughs> that concept, uh, people supported me, and people comes and learn about everything. I mean, I was there to. Uh, explain things about. So, uh, Simbad was, uh, like if you needed translated Quran to English, you find it Simbad. If you needed uh, belly dance custom, you find it Simbad. If you need hummus, you need spices, you need pita bread, you need baklava, the sweets. I mean, uh, the operation was combination of uh, many things. So it was a cultural center. Books, yeah. Uh, I mean, here it was like an oasis uh, for an Arab. It's it's uh, oasis represent a cultural place with no passport. You get in and you learn about many things, beside the music, beside the food, uh, the. Spices, the aroma of the spices, yeah. And the warm welcome. I mean, there was a lady that I bought from her lamb, uh, Alice, from Sweet Meadow Farm close to Rochester, like between Rochester and Minnesota. She was in her 80s. When I buy from her lamb, or order, she bring it to my store. She sit down hours just to watch me how I welcome my customers. And she mentioned, she said, Sammy, I'm eight years old. I never seen a businessman welcome his customers by shaking hand when they come in and when they leave. <laughs> so that was your, your bringing those values that you had grown up with yes. to what you were doing here yes. in Minnesota right. as, as kind of an emissary or Iraqi culture. Or... Yeah, like an ambassador, people-to-people yes. -people diplomacy. What we do now, it's people-to-people -people diplomacy, like bringing Iraqis to here after the Sister City uh, program was signed by both uh, officials, mm -hmm. Arti Rebak from here, and Mr. Al Husseini from Negev. Uh, we start bringing people, like one of them, Heba today, for example. So, so you said that you know you you hadn't been a businessman, you hadn't worked in, with food, but the community 
helped you yes. figure out how to write. Yes. So was there a, was there a big or a, a sizable Iraqi Arabic community in Minneapolis at that time? There was an Arab community, Iraqi or well, little, but after 91 war, uh, many Iraqis came as refugees and settled in, and now we have more and more. Uh, being not a businessman, uh, one of my customers, Jack Shelton from uh, up north where Mississippi River, he lives by the uh, Mississippi spring water when, when it comes. Is that Brainerd or? Uh, I know, no. Bemidji, maybe. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Yep. So he came in, he's an educator, and his wife taught my son, safe, older son, math. But when he came in first, he said, wow, he looked at the uh, decoration that I had. The ceiling were tile, was tile, and there were more than 250 tiles. The place is about 6,000 square foot, the whole place. So these tiles, I brought them down and have an Iraqi artist to paint them with proverbs, Iraqi proverbs, and design them as a rug or Persian carpet and hang to the ceiling. So when the customer used to come and sit down and have uh, a meal, there is a tile at the top of his head. No matter where he sits or she sits, there is a tile, because tiles everywhere. So when they're done with the food, tell them, hey, you want me to tell you what it is? It's in Arabic. And tell them, this is your fortune cookie. So sh should I read it for you? He goes, yes, please. And of course, it's Arabic, and I can't tell them anything. <laughs> they wouldn't know. So it was uh, fun to do that. And this was in Northeast? At yeah. Your, at this point? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So uh, Jack Shelton, when he went in, he said, no businessman spend this much money on just bring the tiles, writing uh, poetries on the wall. I mean, it was like Oasis, as I mentioned in the beginning. And he goes, you are an educator. And he guessed it right. So again, even though a totally different field of work, you're bringing your, your professional yes. experience as an educator. Right to bear in what you were right. doing. And, and how did you, uh, how, how and where and when did you learn English? Uh, of course, when we are in Iraq in the schools, we learn English, but uh, we don't practice it. And that's why I'm uh, initiating this uh, conversational English for reconciliation, uh, for professionals like doctors, engineers, teachers, and others. So, uh, I thought, I, I had few courses in Dubai, English, but when I, in Germany too, but when I came here, it was absolutely different. So uh, I worked hard in uh, reading the paper, uh, watching TV, talking to the people. So it, it took me a good two years uh, until people start, started to understand me and I understand them. <laughs> Immersion. Yes. Immersion learning. Right. And I, and so while you were driving a cab, Here you, go. you were yes. speaking to people yes. and practicing yes. that way. Mm. Okay. Um, and so how did you end up moving from Central Avenue in Northeast to here, to Whittier? Um, actually, we were forced to leave my location in Northeast. Uh, the second precinct the police station were in the same block behind us in the alley. They needed more parking lots, so the city uh, of Minneapolis uh, sent us a letter that you have like six months to find a place and the city will help in relocating us 
by paying the expenses and other stuff. And it was lots of money they paid to get us. So I, I took advantage and went to a bigger place here. Okay. And so, <coughs> and so, so when you moved to Nicollet Avenue, that was about 92? Yes. Somewhere in there? Right. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this chronologically then. So I'm going to go back a little bit while you're still in Northeast. Uh, is when the United States was involved in the first Gulf War. How or did that affect your business? Of course. Big time. I have to cough. Yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> Maybe You're right. a little water. I, and yeah. have, um... Oh, you know what? Is there a yeah. yeah. Of course, um, I had. Am I on? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, you're good. Um, always had my active participation with the peace community already. I mean. Already. Yeah. Okay. And of course, when uh, United States of America, George Bush, uh, senior was planning to go in a war against Iraq. Uh, I was uh, part of the protest uh, against the war. And also, uh, as a, again, uh, a business owner, not a businessman, a business owner, uh, I was reached out by journalist uh, to learn about my opinion about the things, the, the involvement of the U.S. in, in Iraq <clears throat> uh, after Iraq invaded Kuwait. So, uh, yeah, uh, I gave lots of uh, interviews to Pioneer Place, to Star Tribune, to local uh, TVs, and it was about uh, taking stands against the war or against attack in Iraq. Uh, and I explained that uh, Arab countries always get in a fight, uh, then get to reconcile, and, and, uh, and, and just like what happened, I gave an example uh, in the civil war, like here in the, in the past. So um, people see the news, whether in the paper or in the TV, so they keep calling me. If you don't like it here, if you don't like what we're doing, go back home. Something like that. Uh, even when the FBI learned about this, they came to my place and uh, the phone rang and he, there was a lady, an old lady, swearing at me and telling me, hey, you better close your business and leave back home. So the guy from the FBI was listening and trying to explain to her that I'm exercising the right, the first amendment, and he was not like tough to tell her, no, this is wrong, and uh, if you attack the guy, you will be persecuted. No, he was explaining, like taking his time. And Anyway. <laughs> so the FBI was there to, to yes. look into these calls? Yes, because, yeah, because also they called me, they said there is a, a bomb in uh, place, and, so all that was against my business, against my customers. Uh, the bomb squad came and they found nothing. Then uh, the other night, like next night, I uh, had a call from the alarm company saying uh, the alarm went off, what's going on? I went and I got shot. I saw shots in the window, uh, driving by shooting in the window, yeah breaking the glass. So all this was in the media and that brought my name uh, and, and ma made me like known by the community, uh, Twin Cities. Uh, and 
school children, school children came with their uh, like first grade or uh, kindergarten. They came uh, with the roses and flowers. Uh, so they first sent me letters. Then I invited them to come. They came in a bus, and there was I think the media were there. I hosted them. I provided. Uh, for them uh, some food, like pita bread, and, and took them for a tour, in the, and they gave me a statement telling me, whoever tried to attack you is not a real American. That was nice. So you got, you got, you became well known to the local Twin Cities community in positive ways, with yes. this kind of positive support, yeah. as well as yeah. Yeah. the people who right. were... Upset. That was... 1991, like first Gulf. But here, after 9-11, yes. uh, like September 12, 2001, I really hated myself because a month before, I was a star, like movie star, on and, and, and this Minneapolis St. Paul magazine cover with a beautiful picture, like a fez, a red fez, white shirt, red tie, and I think uh, it was red apron. Yeah, with uh, carrying uh, my pita, my signature, which is the best pita, not only in Minneapolis, maybe in the US, maybe in the world, why? Because we kept it made by Manual by hand, not not mass production because mass production uh, uh, doesn't keep the quality that when you make it by hand. So that's why our pita was the best pita. So that picture, uh, right on the cover of a very well known magazine by woman, they they write yeah it was. Uh, uh, <laughs> but by women mo mostly. So uh, lions and lions of people come and ask me to sign the, the, the magazine for them. So uh, help us the business uh, very well. This is in August, but right after that, 9-11 happened and I didn't like that, to be that celebrity because I was known as a Muslim Arab uh, businessman uh, on that cover. Uh, so I didn't want to come and open. My wife said, no, kids say, you have to go that. That's uh, your business and you have nothing to do with what happened yesterday. So I came kind of a little bit late, opened and operated, but told the manager, Hayat Germanos, Lebanese Christian. She was managing the place and her husband was the baker. I told her, Tony, her, her husband, I'm going to help Tony baking the bread, so I'm not here. Take messages if anybody comes. Close to noon that day, September 12th, she came running to the bakery, said, Sammy, there are two women asking about you, but they are crying. Please come. I hope nothing happened to your family members. Nothing wrong with them. So I went out and from distance recognized the faces. They are local, long-time customers. I don't recall their names. Uh, they were crying and I thought, what's wrong? Please. They said, we need a few minutes um, to speak to you. Oh, please, yeah, sit down. They gave me a piece of paper. I look at it. It's their names, phone numbers, and address. They said, F this is for you. Uh, if you need to come and have safe haven. Because last night, we saw a person chased in New Jersey and killed simply because he looked like an Arab, but he was Mexican. And another guy in Phoenix, Arizona, at his restaurant with a turban Sikh, 
was killed assuming that he was a Muslim, but he was not Muslim. And we thought about you right away. You made this street beautiful, the oasis again, that you provide everything we missed in each street and Nicollet Avenue. So this is a treasure that we would like to keep and you are the main treasure as a brother. You took care of us every time we come here, shop and eat. So this is for you and for your uh, family members. Please come over anytime you like, but you should not get hurt. By the way, we are Jewish from St. Louis Park. So that was a civic uh, lesson, profound wisdom that I learned from it. Uh, here you go, uh, <clears throat> two Jewish women, a Muslim, and the Christian Lebanese manager, Hayat, she was standing behind me crying, and they were crying, so that brought my tear down. And I told Hayat, please bring us some food because the buffet, we had buffet like style food service. She made an array of uh, samplers of what we have. And I asked Hayat to sit down with us and have a bite. Uh, so we were Christian Jews and Muslims uh, sharing food, but not only that, sharing uh, our uh, worries, uh, vision. Uh, uh, we were like asking ourselves, what should we do to overcome this crisis? Uh, and the idea was uh, to create a Jewish Muslim dialogue. And uh, we meet whenever we can, once a week bi-weekly or once a month. Men think we bring kids with us to learn, to watch us how we share food and, and respect each other. So that started after? That, that started, yes. 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 After yes. September 12th? After September 12th and then spread it out, became mm -hmm. uh, something called uh, interfaith uh, dialogue. I mean, not only in uh, town in the Twin City, but uh, nationwide. Yeah, not, not because of us, but but the the idea spread it across the country. Yeah. So so then on September twelfth, two thousand one, you got a very lovely expression of support. Yes. From your Jewish customers. Yes. Did you have any negative response? Well, the negative response. Um, while I was there, after they left, a young man walked in with a bandana, and the bandana was American flag, with blonde woman asking for a Turkish coffee called Mehmet. Mehmet means Muhammad, but in Turkey they call it Mehmet. So I told him, yeah, I have it, and I start uh, started explaining to them uh, how to make it. They said, I know, man, I'm from Turkey. So I looked at him, I told him, you scared me off. I mean, I, I thought you were intimidating. He said, no, this is for protection. So nobody, I'm Turkish, so nobody will attack me. And later on, I found out most of the cars that drive by and we with right away after 9-11, with an American flag in the back, like tamed American flag in the back. Mostly are Somalis and <laughs> immigrants who protection. are Arabs. Protection, yeah, for protection. So that was, in my thought, an intimidation or negative, but was not of that. But actually, and I hate to say this, 9-11 was good for my business. Most of the people who, from the neighborhood, were my customers. They wanted to support me so I don't fail as a Muslim Arab operator, food op uh, manufacturer or operator. So they started bringing 
uh, their friends, introducing our food to other people, our community, yeah, other community. So we were really busy, like threefold went up the business, but not for too long. I mean, people keep coming, but yeah, then it's affected, I mean, a long run. So, so that brings me to a question. Who were your customers mostly? Were they people from the neighborhood? Were they other Muslims? They, they, were, they were mixed, m mixture, yeah. Uh, the hummus, the falafel, the baba ganoj, all this in like sandwich, like gyros, this became known by an average American and, and it has its own market. So, uh, I, I can say 50-50. Okay. Yeah. The like Muslims who came for the pita for the the grocery, uh, and also the restaurant uh, department or uh, part of the operation was mostly uh, uh, consumed by American white American Americans and and others, but the groceries uh, was consumed and the pita by uh, mostly. Urban Muslim people. By people who would buy products from the market they, and go home and cook. Yeah, they come to buy their food, what they have, what they used to, like halal, for example, which is like kosher. So, this is the meat and chicken. We had it too. Okay. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about the business itself and the food. Um, how how. What proportion of your business do you think was um, the cafe where people would come and eat there versus the people who would come and buy things from the market? Was it about a 50-50 split? Um, as I said, most herbs come by grocery stores, so, uh, grocery uh, items. I had trucks coming to supply me with this uh, grocery stuff twice a month, like truck ro load, 10 to 12 skids. So that was good. The pita, uh, the workers in the morning with, with the baker, they come at four. By nine, they are done baking. And what they do, an average between 10 to 15, 50 pounder of bag of flour. So that's lots of pita. And <coughs> Before noon, that's gone. From 9 to 12, the bread, gone. I start hearing, started hearing comments, Sammy has the best bread, but he doesn't have it. Meant it goes fast. So when they come after 12, sorry, you have to order or you have to come early, something like that. And, and because we kept maintained to produce the pita manually, that's time consuming and very, uh, the, the cost is high. Not like you have a machine and just mass produce it. So you did not come from a business or a baking, cooking no. background. So how no. did you learn that you, the best pita is made by hand and that you were going to stick with that process? I, I actually didn't learn because uh, I didn't bake it. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there was uh, Holy Land before I started the business. And Holy Land had uh, those bakers, before he moved his operation to mass production, he had it manually too. So he had... Uh, Pancho, I remember this Mexican uh, baker, and he had an Afghani baker. So the Afghani baker, baker was not happy with the, yeah, with the owner of, he said, Sammy, I'll come and work for you. I heard that you are a nice guy, whatever. <laughs> so he came and started teaching me and teaching others. I learned it from the Afghani. The Afghani is not an Arab. It's, it's not his profession originally, but he learned it from others at Holy Land. Captain Tatas, I bake only in emergencies if I don't have a baker or baker gets sick or 
absent, so I have to do it because we have to have pita. People come for the pita. And later on, when this woman, the Lebanese, and her husband came, they made the best pita. I mean, the husband made the best pita, but the husband never ever allowed me to learn it. He said, Sammy, this is our secret. And I am sure if I teach you, you will give it away because you are a good guy. Not a businessman. Yeah. Not a businessman. You will give it away because you like to share it with others. So I put camera. He said, don't play this game. Take the camera. He, he already took it away. And yeah, <laughs> so we didn't know how it was. I tell you something. The PETA initiated in Palestine. The old PETA. Then separated across Arab uh, countries. So I remember there was a Palestinian old man comes here. He said, Sammy, I just landed. I took a taxi to come to your place to buy the pita because we don't have this in Palestine anymore. We have the mass production and always he blamed Bill Gates for it because Bill Gates computerized the world. <laughs> software. So those big ovens, like conveyor ovens, they work uh, uh, electronically by computers and it produce mass, mass, but does, didn't have, it doesn't have the quality that we have uh, when we make it at Simba, or when, when, when Tony makes it. Tony Lebanese, so he has his own uh, way to make it. So it sounds like you relied quite a bit on your staff yes. to make Sinbad successful. Right, correct. Okay. Um, and did the, was the food that you both prepared in the cafe part and that you sold in the market, was it very similar, exactly the same as the kind of food you ate growing up? No. Uh, the combination of the food we had it here is absolutely different what we had. Partially, yes because I had three cooks. One from North Africa makes the couscous tagine and this Moroccan Tunisian food. And the Lebanese uh, manager, she did the Syrian, Lebanese, Jordanian food and Iraqi. The Iraqi made the food uh, that's available in the Gulf state, Arab Gulf state area, like Saudis and Kuwaitis and Iraqi. And so what, give me an example of what um, a quintessential Iraqi dish is. The kebab, uh, yes. The kebab, Iraqi kebab is different. There is Iranian kebab, there is uh, Jordanian and, and Arab, other Arab countries kebab, but it's not like the Iraqi kebab. The Iraqi kebab, a <laughs> little bit fatty, and that's why it's a little uh, tasty. And... Um, that's one thing, and also uh, we uh, made the lamb, the whole lamb. That's an Iraqi thing. So we had an oven, a special oven, to make the whole lamb, uh, roasting lamb. And the idea came after uh, watching a pre-existed business, but it's Vietnamese, uh, Hiptan, next to us, and actually became later my landlord. They uh, roasted the uh, whole pork. Yes. So I go, oh, they, they do that. We do lamb. Then I brought the same oven that he used, uh, used to, to um, uh, roast lamb, whole lamb. So that went very well. I'm getting hungry. Yeah. Uh, and of course, hummus, falafel, babu. This is not an Iraqi thing. That's like uh, Leb Lebanon, uh, Palestine and Syria, Jordan, Jordanian, yeah. And the couscous tagine and harira, this is uh, North African food. So, so we've talked a bit about your business and your customers. What about the neighborhood? What was Whittier, Nicollet Avenue like when you moved in? Well, uh, way back, actually, to tell you the truth, I liked the space. It was cheap. 
It was sitting there for a long time, not rented, uh, but I had to find a place and I uh, was about to run out of time uh, to move because I was the last one to move from that block. I mean, the bulldozers were, were about to rock the place, yes. So uh, the area I didn't like because it was like a pocket uh, closed by the market uh, and, and uh, Nicollet from Hyatt. So it was blocked except for taxis and buses and police uh, cars to go. It's not open for the public. And also Kmart. And, and, and this area was uh, known by drug dealings and prostitution, other stuff. So we, we were like pioneers to change the face of this uh, avenue. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, Christus was there. Um, the Black Forest was there. Uh, I remember uh, Carl Walk of uh, uh, the Seafood Palace and myself, I mean Simbad's, were the beginner to, to begin uh, change the avenue uh, from both sides. Then Acadia, the, the Tom Berthium started his coffee shop, then uh, other places uh, uh, opened up. So, so tell me a little bit about how you and, and some of these other business owners on Nicollet worked to transform the street and the neighborhood. And it's a very different place now than yes, it was. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, the owner uh, of Black Forest, uh, Joanne and uh, Chris, I think. Erish. Erish. Uh, Tom Berthium and uh, Tammy from Rainbow. Uh, if I remember... Uh, the Whittier uh, Alliance uh, administration, uh, we were called to meet and talk about something to promote the street because the street became a unique uh, place. And we started uh, uh, doing uh, advertisement, uh, TV ads, um, a very heavy uh, um, uh, advertisement in the papers uh, yeah, and, and uh, we raised funds to uh, clean up the streets, uh, put signs. Uh, so uh, we were committed to, to, for success and, and we succeeded. So uh, it was, uh, I enjoyed the work. It was not that hard, but uh, it needed commitment. So you were part of the whole streetscape yes. project, the yes. branding of East right. Street. And actually we helped to build a bridge to the Third Avenue Bridge was part of uh, our participation. Yeah. And you the Marshall like, Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. You feel like it was a successful yeah. effort? Yeah, yeah. Do, Still do I have in Iraq the model of the bridge was given to me as souvenir huh. kept because we, we spend good time and some money yeah, okay. to support the project. So the uh, Eat Street so one thing I didn't like, because when they did design the logo, they put the, uh, the sewer cap, street sewer cap. Um, yeah, they changed it then. Yeah, it was changed. So did, after, the, after Nicollet was improved, the streetscape project was done, that was in 1997? Yes. Those months? Yes. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's lighter, there are lights installed, it just looks yeah. nicer, people are more... Yeah. Did, did the, you tr notice? the trolley became... That's right. Yeah, That's start right. coming, bringing tourists. That's right. And did show you notice, them. did it affect your business? Of course. No. But then what happened, the construction, the road construction. Uh, I had uh, about 150000 dollar loan from uh, Associated Bank to open Simbad, so I had to pay it back. But uh, what happened, the construction just blocked the avenue 
and it was very difficult to operate. Uh, but the bank helped us, helped us in stopping asking to pay until the avenue was uh, completed, Con yeah, the construction. And did was... business recover after the yes. road was done? Oh, yeah, of course, yes. Did it, did it improve because now Nicolette yes. Whittier looked better? Oh, 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 of well? course, yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, Spy House opened to a grocery store, but uh, they had trouble with uh, food stands and other stuff. Well, they were raided a few times by the FBI. But then the Spy House really added a ni nice flavor. Uh, the, I remember the Chinese restaurants here uh, opened Yummy, or before that, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. another different name. It changed a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so would you, how would you have described your working relationship with other business owners? Along the well, country? first thing, I decided to give myself and my co-workers one day off was Monday. And on Monday, we used to go and try other foods, like give business to uh, a different, uh, it was 19 blocks of international uh, cuisines, yeah, and, and restaurants. So on Monday, you find me m moving for my lunch in this spot, for dinner in the other spot, to try and support uh, the uh, businesses, other businesses. So it was very collegial. Yes. So tell me, so that was 1997, you talked a little bit about the effects of 9-11. Tell me about your decision to close Sinbad's and move back to I didn't want to close it, but I uh, was approached by uh, an investor who was looking for a place here, and he learned that I had the uh, desire to go back uh, to Iraq because I couldn't uh, like take the invasion and the occupation easily while I'm here sitting in my living room watching the death toll and other uh, destruction. So we spoke about buying the store and keep it as it is. So he kept it four years. Four years. Yeah. In 2008, uh, the landlord of the whole block uh, approached him and told him, hey, you have 20 years lease with me, but I want to tear the whole building down and build a high rise, invested in real estate. So I think he paid him money to get out. And at that point, Fred, his name, Farid Jurius, I, he, he didn't have the idea to reopen Simbad or relocate Simbad somewhere else. So he got the money in. And, and, and that was the end of Simbad's in 2008. In 2008. Yeah. You're, you were back now in Iraq by, for what, almost four years by that time? Yes. In 2008? Yes. Uh, actually, before I sold it to Farid, I had a meeting with my kids and I discussed with them the idea that if they like to take over and continue. Mm -hmm. But they said, Dad, we're not crazy like you. To, <laughs> this is hard, difficult. But now, they said, please, Dad, help us to reopen Simbad's. You have nothing to do. Just tell us how to make the pita, how to run the place, whom to contact, to get supplies, yeah. Uh, and they said, we missed, we were stupid. Yeah, we didn't take over, we missed, because now they, part-time, they, they, they work in restaurants, yeah. Had they helped you when they were young? Had yes, they yes. Over at yeah. so well, they were... because they helped me, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, didn't like to eat there at Simbad's. Uh, they go to McDonald's <laughs> and other places to eat. They were born here, and, and yeah, they like the fast food. 
I, I was bribe the, bribing them, like, to, hey, I give you $10, just eat here. They say, yeah, we eat. And uh, I give them $10, they go like, mm -hmm. then that we would like to play football in the alley. But I find them at McDonald's, <laughs> spending the $10 there. <laughs> Until now. Now, now no, they, they eat everything, they eat everything, but not uh, McDonald's and uh, fast food. I mean, uh, they love the Middle Eastern food and they cook. When I come here, they cook for me. And I think oh, I will, nice. yeah. So, why did you go back to Iraq? Um, I uh, couldn't function well after the war. I felt I betray betrayed myself, like Sammy the American start torturing, killing, uh, uh, invading, uh, occupying Sammy the Iraqi. So it was kind of inner war inside me. So my food became less, my sleep became less, couldn't sleep, uh, getting sick, cannot come and operate. Uh, I needed to go and visit in, right after the invasion for four weeks. And I saw the signs of the destruction and start blaming myself. This happened because I left Iraq when I was 24. Yeah, and, and this desire started growing up while, when I came back to go back and do something, rebuild the country, help to bring the people together and b explain to them that the U.S. is not like always John Wayne or, uh, or Silver Stallone, like the Rambo or, or George Bush or these GIs they, they met during the invasion occupation. Explain to them what's the with your alliances, the people that I met, the people give me business, supported me, uh, explain to them what the uh, Christian environment, Christian culture looks like. So all these things, it was my job to bring people together. Then uh, in 2009, we uh, were able to link some, uh, Minneapolis and uh, Najaf as sister cities, so stop bringing people back and forth. What I did here, it was intensified effort to bring the Arab culture to the U.S., make it through the operation. That probably was not enough. So still it's people to people diplomacy. And by me going back, there and coming now, go same thing. Uh, uh, it's still people to people diplomacy, but wider range. Instead of being here stationed, I'm moving back and forth. Was it hard to move back? Yes, of course. I mean, any amount of smoke you see there, it's a black, dark, because. It's this destruction smoke. I come here, I see white smoke. It's factories or heating that we don't have. Uh, manufacturing places. I mean, this is the difference. I go there, I put a mask because the air is polluted. I come here, the air is cleaner. Uh, there, the water makes me sick. I come here, I get nourished again. So uh, th this is the difference, but not uh, culturally shocking, but only the difference like you, heal f you here feel, s feel safer while they're not. This is uh, the, the difference, but still for me to survive, I have to do this and go back and forth. So aside from the people and the values and all the, the positive things that you've described about Iraq when you were there, you know, for the first 24 years of your life. Um, how different is Iraq now from those first 24 years you were there? Um, it's worse. I mean, it's still chaotic. It's still dangerous. 
uh, I thought I should do something, but I feel I failed. Still, I bring people, receive people there, but it's a fraction. It's, it's like a drop in, in the ocean. But without this, I don't have a hope. Without this, I cannot function, I cannot continue. So I have to do it uh, anyways. But you ask me how things are in Iraq, unfortunately, it's not good. It's not promising. Um, I mean, Mosul. <laughs> we didn't have Mosul, I mean, problem when, like five years ago or 10 years ago. We didn't have uh, many, many problems now as a result, byproducts of the main product. Always I refer to Arab-Israel conflict that started in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, now from the 90s, 2000, it, it, it became different. So unfortunately, the whole region is, is in a fire. It's endless, yeah. It, in chaos and, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, settled or, 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 yeah, it's, it's a big mess. But your efforts to contribute what you can to improving the situation have been things like the Muslim Peacekeepers team, um, the English for Reconciliation, this people-to-people -people yes. diplomacy yes. that you've yes. been describing. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, not this March, last month, March 2016, I was in Somalia, invited by friends whom I met here, Somali friends. And after they got their uh, education, they went back. Now they are in the government. So in part of one part of Somalia called Puntland, I was invited by a couple of my close friends whom paid for everything to go there. Uh, and they offered me uh, job to, to work with them, uh, be uh, an advisor or something like that. Uh, so I learned that it's Busaso, the city I went. And Busaso is the city of Minneapolis. So since Najaf and Busaso are both sister city of Minneapolis, now we are working Busaso and Najaf making them sister city. So when I go, the, I, when I leave in, in the, 20th, next month we will uh, have the mayor of Bosaso coming to Negev and uh, signing an agreement to have both cities, sister cities. And, and uh, we spoke about having some uh, education uh, cooperation beside constructions, uh, some trade, uh, projects by they they have lots of livestock like sheep and and goats and cows to to send to Iraq while they need like cement and other stuff some some, some construction companies because uh, this part of Somalia need to be rebuilt mm. yeah so we're we're working in in that aspect too so mm. this is another project we're engaged with plus I work with uh, a youth organization in Iraq. Uh, those youth organization, uh, they need to be uh, directed and advised uh, what to do. And we help them uh, to come, some of them to come here, do the Fulbright uh, education, the, the um, programs. Uh, and also uh, they are building their libraries to uh, make books available to the young people to read. So we help them uh, in that aspect. Uh, there is a project uh, which is uh, coming in this summer, medical group 
of Iraqis coming here for uh, observations and training. And we helped before uh, some medical uh, group who came here and got some uh, training. Um, in next fall, there are five women from Mosul, uh, but with different uh, ethnicity, background, ethnicity, and, and religion. They are, uh, with my help, planning to come here to have a tour to speak about the situation uh, uh, in Mosul. So uh, one of them is Christian, the other is uh, Yazidis, uh, Turkoman, uh, Muslims, Sunni and Shia. Yeah, so we're trying to do this uh, to bring uh, a close picture on, on what's going on in Mosul, in Iraq, by uh, bringing this woman to speak about. Um, are you, I forgot to ask this earlier, uh, but you are an American citizen. Yes. So you became an American, a naturalized yes. citizen. 2001, I mean, see, 2001 in, in July, uh, June, June 21st, uh, I became a citizen. I took the oath uh, and got the citizen. And <laughs> it was a real uh, nice day for celebration. I, I accomplished my dream to be an American. And my kids uh, uh, liked it very much. They said, Dad, you're American. We are American now, too. So congratulations. Uh, this youngest son, Tarek, he said, Dad, uh, you remember before you couldn't vote, but now you can vote your president, next president. And um, you will have a passport that you can fly everywhere. And also, now culturally, you are qualified to use your middle finger too. So I told him, what's this all about? He said, well, you remember when we were, we were not American, you said, don't use your middle finger. This is not Islamic thing. And actually, we used differently. I mean, yeah, but I never told him that. So, so uh, then he said, can I use it, please? Come on, democracy. Tell him, yes, go ahead. So he gave me the finger. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so, that so was I'm part of the June 21st <laughs> celebration <laughs> for being, yeah, for being, <laughs> I was confirmed an American citizen. <laughs> culturally, <laughs> culturally, <laughs> I was uh, qualified. <laughs> He gave me the qualification. It's the American dream. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I, I want to wrap things up here. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, so it's still, as something you, you said early on in our conversation, it's still standing 100% Iraqi, 100% American. American. You put that together becomes 200% humanist. And that's what, your, that's what your work reflects. Yes, and uh, uh, I was surprised when I heard President Trump, when he was running for uh, an office in 2016, uh, his statement about banning Muslims. Uh, so right away I wrote him uh, an invitation open invitation to visit my family in Najaf. And I told him, hey, there will be no cost to you. You just come, take your plane, come over, and you can stay as long as you want. You will watch how I uh, deal with my wife as a Muslim, as an Arab, how my kids treat me and I, my wife and I treat our kids, take you to the neighborhoods, just education, learn about us before you uh, ban us or you do anything. By the way, I don't, if you come, I will promise you, I'll come to Las Vegas and I will gamble, despite the fact where Muslims are banned from gambling, but I'll do it for you. <laughs> Make some money. <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah, I emphasize on education, how education is important. Because if you are the most famous qualified professor in the world, you're still a student. So no matter you are a businessman or president or a teacher, father or mother, you're still students learning every day something new. Is there anything else you would like to say before we wrap things up? Well, thank you so much for this opportunity and really I feel uh, I'm part of this lovely neighborhood. And by the way, I run for, uh, for, for a chair at, at uh, Whittier and I won. And they told me I got the most votes. And at that year, I think it was 2004. So at that year, the same year, I won, I left. But I told the people who voted for me a little story. My brother-in-law in Iraq was stopped during the occupation by an American checkpoint. So my brother-in-law, when he was done with the inspection, asked the GI, the vet, Iraq vets who inspected, where are you from? So I told him I'm from Minnesota. He said, wow, my brother-in-law has a restaurant there. And then he goes, what's called? He says, Simba. Of course, Sammy, the GI replied. <laughs> he, then he said, let me hug you. May I may smell Sammy on you, something like that. So I brought this story to tell them the world is really small and whether we like it or not, whether it's occupation or not, we are connected. So uh, they like that story. <laughs> I thought I'd bring it to you. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Sammy, for taking your time out of your My pleasure. trip here to Texas. You, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That was fabulous.